Up next, how a coming-of-age encounter with an older woman on the knoll of a jazz festival went from being a blow to a teenager's manhood to the breakout number one smash of an international superstar. The crazy but true story details are coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you remember a time where we only had three or four channels on TV that you could watch, you're going to love this channel. <laughs> Pure, unadulterated nostalgia. Make sure that you subscribe below so you never miss out. Check the box so you know when they're coming. We also have a Patreon with all kinds of exclusive content, including some upcoming specials, specifically a live event that I'm going to do on uh, the history of Professor Rock. Uh, just click on the link below for that, and also check out our latest merch. That's just below. So it's time for another episode from our series, The New Standards, the show that takes an in-depth look into songs that transcend genre, decade, and fad, songs that are monumental touchstones in our culture and our society that never die. On previous episodes, we've covered Cats in the Cradle by Eric Shapin, Ordinary World by Duran Duran, and Somebody by Depeche Mode. Now, today's song inductee was a number one hit in 1971. But it kind of started in the summer of 1961, where Roderick David Stewart, Rod for short, Rod Stewart, and a bunch of his buddies, they sneaked into the Beaulieu Jazz Festival in Hampshire, England, uh, by stealthily crawling through a large runoff pipe that led into the festival grounds, apparently. Once they were inside the festival, uh, the lads made a beeline to the beer tent where 16-year-old Rod was approached by a much older woman on the prowl. She was looking to entice a young man to satisfy, uh, to say, her carnal urges. It didn't take much to convince a 16-year-old Rod to saunter off with his pursuer to a private patch of lawn where, to say, he lost his innocence. Uh, the whole experience lasted uh, less than a minute, apparently, leaving Rod disappointed and embarrassed by how quickly it all ended. Little did he know that his embarrassing moment would be the impetus to one of the grandest songs, the 70s. Uh, the journey to get to that point, that was even more compelling. Ten years later, he would reflect back on that experience as the inspiration to compose Maggie May, an unlikely hit that vaulted him from rock celebrity status in the UK to global superstar. Long before Rod Stewart was uh, knighted Sir Rod and a Hall of Fame performer selling more than a quarter of a billion records. That's just astonishing to me. He was uh, once a blue collar teenager working as a paper boy and a grave digger at the Highgate Cemetery in London. Now, when he began to pursue music, he busked his way across Europe, you know, playing the harmonica. At perhaps his lowest point, Rod was sleeping under bridges in Barcelona, Spain, and was arrested for vagrancy and then deported. Of course, in the late 60s, Rod was recruited to be the lead vocalist for the Jeff Beck group, and he later followed his friend Ron Wood to join the Small Faces, uh, eventually abbreviating the name to uh, just Faces. Rod released his first solo album, An Old Raincoat Won't Ever Let You Down, in 1969. I always loved that album title. And then his second solo offering, Gasoline Alley, in 70. It was in 1971, while he was working on material for his third solo LP, Every Picture Tells a Story, uh, that things got really interesting for Rod Stewart. So one evening, uh, Rod was sitting in his living room with his friend and writing partner, guitarist Martin Quintenton, uh, brainstorming for his song ideas. So Martin began fooling around with a few chords, and he constructed a melody for Rod to put lyrics on top of. Uh, the theme of the song hadn't been established at that point. Now, like most Rod Stewart originals, the song began with a melody, with uh, Rod Stewart writing music over the instrumental bed, while Quintenton uh, played his impromptu melody. Rod began to sing the words from an old Liverbadian uh, folk song that was titled Maggie May, about a sailor that is robbed by a prostitute. The music and lyrics of the folk song Maggie May, you know, sometimes spelled with an E on the end instead of a Y, they were written by Lionel Bart, who is also the creator of the musical Oliver, 
Uh, the song was used as the backstory behind the Maggie Mae musical that Bart composed about what happens at the shipping docks of Liverpool. Of course, it was also a song way before that. Um, there's a lot of history behind this song. Anyway, if you recall, the Beatles recorded a condensed 40-second version of the tune on side one of the Let It Be album. That was in 1970, and it goes like this. Oh, dirty Maggie Mae, they have taken her away, and she'll never walk down Line Street anymore. Oh, the judge, he guilty found her for robbing the homeward bounder, that dirty, no-good Robin Maggie May. So back in Rod's living room in 1971, the more Quintenton played the guitar melody, the more Rod reflected on his teenage romp with that older woman. And the focus for the new song turned into a May-December romance that had reached a crossroads. Although Rod stated that the name of the temptress was not Maggie, he borrowed the title of the old standard, and he made Maggie the subject of the song, starting with the opening verse. Wake up, Maggie, I think I got something to say to you. Simply, one of the most memorable and singable opening lines from a song ever. It's so great. Uh, the exasperated line, Maggie, I couldn't have tried anymore. and the bristling exclamation in the song's conclusion. Maggie, I wish I'd never seen your face. Just brilliant. Quintenton and Stewart finished drafting Maggie May in Rod's living room. But when they met up with the other musicians for the Every Picture Tells a Story studio sessions, there was no intention of Maggie May even making the cut. At least, not at that point. Now, as we get into the validity of the song as a hit record, I want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear, the glasses that I always wear. Summer is here, and it's a great time for a good pair of sunglasses. And you know what? Zenny's got you covered. You can get prescription sunglasses for less than the price of a vinyl record. You can get regular frames starting at just $6.95. It's the perfect purchase if you need glasses right now. Make sure to design your own pair at zenny.com today. September and I really should be so it wasn't until Rod's record company insisted on one more original track for the album and that Rod pulled the song from the back burner to actually record it. He wasn't even going to record it. And those days, Rod liked to record music as fast as possible you know, to avoid paying any extra fees for longer studio time. Maggie Mae was recorded in just two takes, and that included Rod's consummate vocal performance. Ron Wood, Ian McLagan, and uh, Mickey Waller, who were bandmates with Stewart and Faces, and the Jet Beck group, for that matter, they all played on Maggie Me. I should add, however, that the cymbal crashes on the track were overdubbed on the recording because, get this, Waller forgot to bring his cymbals to the recording session. I love drummers. Since the song was inspired by a folk tune, it was decided, albeit at the last minute, that Maggie May should include a mandolin. Now, that's an instrument that is widely associated, of course, with folk music. But to perform the mandolin parts, Rod hired Ray Jackson, a British musician who was a member and co-lead singer for the band Lindisfarne. Now, we covered Lindisfarne on the... Uh, uh, 70s Hidden Gems, uh, I think it was last year. So the way Rod actually presented Maggie May to Jackson was hilarious. Jackson was already commissioned to play on the album cut Mandolin Wind, eventually track number three on side one of Every Picture Tells a Story. So after Jackson played his part on Mandolin Wind, Rod offered Jackson an extra 15 pounds to play on Maggie May. I've got this other song called Maggie May, is what he would say. I might not even use it, but I've got nothing to put on the end of this, so can you put some mandolin down on this song? So Jackson agreed to the offer to uh, expand his services, but he only had two minutes to invent a mandolin solo for what Rod presented as a really bothersome incidental track. Little did Rod know, at that time, but Ray Jackson's improvised mandolin performance would end up as the soaring highlight for the song that would be the huge breakout for Rod the Mod. 
Jackson, too, was dumbfounded by what transpired. Uh, his really off-the-cuff contribution to Maggie May gave the song a model and uh, nostalgic aura that, that made it an emotional powerhouse of a song. Ray Jackson's solo on Maggie May is arguably the most famous mandolin solo of the entire rock era. Of course, there have been some notable tracks that feature a prominent mandolin section, including, of course, Battle of Evermore by Led Zeppelin, I Will Dare by The Replacements, one of my favorites, and Friend of the Devil by The Grateful Dead, among others. And of course, there are big pop hits with a heavy mandolin sound, uh, such as Mandolin Rain, one of the great songs of, of 87 by Bruce Hornsby and the Range. Takes the chill from the air. Of course, Losing My Religion by R.E.M. and Iris by the Goo Goo Dolls, which also went to number one on the airplay chart for months. It was like 18 weeks. Stop me if you've heard this one before. The label didn't like Maggie May. Even Rod Stewart thought the song was, at best, a filler track. To Rod, his song had rambling lyrics, no chorus to speak of, and really no hook. So Maggie May was placed where many album cuts with no hope of hit potential are stuck on the B-side of a 45 single. Uh, Maggie May, you might recall, was originally the B-side to the single Reason to Believe a song written and recorded by Tim Harden in 65 and one of Rod's best vocals. Uh, exquisite interpretation by Rod Stewart there. However, once radio programmers became familiar with the B-side, they actually opted to put the song in rotation and incredibly, Maggie may quickly overshadow reason to believe. Now, there is debate over which radio station was the first to flip the disc, you know, the play Maggie May. Uh, Chuck Buell, uh, the music director at WLS in Chicago, he claims he was the first to spin Maggie May, while Mitch Michaels at WMMS in Cleveland said that he was the first. Rod Stewart apparently believes that it was Michaels who led the charge, saying that he would still be digging graves if it wasn't for a diligent DJ in Cleveland you know, who discovered Maggie May. Of course, that's probably being a, a little bit dramatic because Rod was already doing great things, but... Uh, Rod's version of Reason to Believe sputtered. It stalled at, uh, I believe, number 62, while Maggie Mee overcame the B-side banishment and climbed all the way to the top of the Billboard Hot 100. Sold over 2 million copies in America alone. Maggie Mae also went to number one in the UK, and it went to number one in Canada, and it went top five in Ireland, Netherlands, New Zealand, Switzerland. In fact, the single on the album made him the first artist ever to top both the main charts on both sides of the Atlantic at the same time. Quite a feat. It was number one on the album charts and the singles chart in both the UK and America. It was a bona fide smash that catapulted the name Rod Stewart to the front line of every media outlet in 71. It was all because of Maggie May. Now, the album version of Maggie May features a guitar intro performed by Martin Quintenton titled Henry. Quintenton recalled hearing Maggie May playing out of a jukebox in a London pub, and he uh, learned shortly after that that the song had made it to number one. And all he could do was shake his head, trying to figure out what the fuss was all about. Surprisingly, like Rod, Quintenton never regarded Maggie May as being really that good. Quintenton and Rod teamed up again to co-author another number one single in the UK, You Wear It Well, from the Rod's fourth solo LP, Never a Dull Moment. That was in 72. Uh, that peaked at number 13 in the States. You wear it well, a little at a time. The friendship between Quintenton and Rod went back to the time that he was asked to join Faces. Uh, but Quintenton hated the heavy drinking and the hotel room wrecking that the band was notorious for. And he uh, preferred to remain quietly in the background. Now, suffering from mental illness, he left the music business, sadly, and retired to the countryside of Wales. Actually, Martin Quintenton passed away in 2015. 
Now, Ray Jackson's mandolin work on Maggie Mae that we talked about, that was highly praised by his peers. And following the song's enormous success, Jackson felt that he deserved much more recognition and uh, much more compensation for what he gave to the song. Actually, Jackson sued Rod in 2003, stating that he was convinced that his mandolin riffs on the recording of Maggie Mae were essential to its commercial achievement. He also felt incredibly disrespected when he was unnamed on the album notes, the liner notes for Every Picture Tells a Story. He was referred to as the mandolin player from Lindisfarne, whose name I can't remember. Uh, probably a little bit of British humor there that uh, wasn't taken so well. Uh, Jackson actually threatened legal action against Rod unless he was given a writing credit. Rod actually employed Jackson for tracks that came after Every Picture Tells a Story, uh, with a statement from his spokesperson that read, As is always the case in the studio and musical contributions he may have made were fully paid at the time as work for hire. Uh, the case was never brought to court. Now, let's address the question that many have wondered about since the song rose to prominence in 1971. Who was the real Maggie May that took Rod's virginity and if her name wasn't Maggie May, what was her real name? Now, at first Rod said her name was not Maggie May. Then he said he didn't think that was her name. However, there is a woman named Margaret May Butlu who has been linked to the role in the grass with Rod. Margaret, who her friends called Maggie May, confided that once word got around that she and uh, young Rod Stewart hooked up, and you know, when Maggie May exploded onto the radio, she was constantly the butt of jokes with people throwing lines from the song at her, you know, especially the memorable opening line, Maggie, I think I got something to say to you. you come, Maggie, I think I got something to say to you. Yeah, I bet you she heard that one every single day. Uh, I think if Rod wanted us to know, he would have told us by now. So the older woman's name will always be his secret. There's so many songs like that. You're so vain. People try to figure out who it's about. There's a good chance that he never caught her name. I don't think that was a priority. Jokes. My love you didn't need to coax. That day at that particular jazz festival may not have been Rod's finest moment as a young man, but the encounter surely inspired one of his finest songs. Maybe the finest song of his career. Rod may have regarded Maggie May as a rambling song, without a chorus, no real hook, but it was the story of the song that really hooked us, and the emotional vulnerability of its narration that reeled us in. Rod Stewart surely has one of the most distinct and imaginative and electric voices of the rock era. He took his own life experience and breathed a, a quintessential performance into this hit to make it one of the greatest songs of the rock era. It's a song that I've known by heart since I can remember. I mean, my mom was in love with Rod Stewart. My dad was a fan as well. And they played the record, Every Picture Tells a Story, all the time. I, probably since I was crawling on the floor, even before that. My dad told me how this song came to be. Um, I remember he would joke with me that Maggie May was the Mrs. Robinson of the 70s. He told me how it was first a B-side and then was turned over by a DJ, thus making Rod the superstar that he is now. I always wonder how my dad knew all these stories that he'd tell me. I remember a few years before he passed away, I, I did ask him, how do you know all the backstories of all these songs? I remember he said something to the effect of, I just love music, so I was listening intently. Um, I suppose they were passed down to me. I read them somewhere or heard them on the radio. I always remembered them, so I guess I passed them down to you because you were always so passionate about music like me. All I can say is I'm so glad you did, Dad. And today I want to end with uh, dedicating this song, this number one hit from 1971 by Sir Rod to my parents. Thanks for raising me on great music. I'm trying to do the same with my kids. I hope you are too. Leave us a comment about this exceptional number one hit from The Mighty Rod. What are your memories of Maggie May and the album Every Picture Tells a Story? What are your thoughts and feelings about Rod Stewart and his output with the faces and, and later in the 70s and 80s? Let us know in the comments. Now, if you enjoyed this video, make sure to subscribe below, hit the red button. 
That way you'll never miss out on our daily dose of nostalgia through interview and story. And make sure to look us up on Patreon. Help us keep the music alive. That's what we're here for. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. Stay safe. Thank you.